Mr. Speaker, I rise in support of the... Oh. Speaker giving you the okay to proceed. Member, you may now proceed. The speaker recognizes you. Thank you, Mr. S Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Deputy Speaker, I was just reviewing some of the allocations um, that had already been made for some schools in the south. <laughs> uh, and in my history report, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I did not observe you in the chair. Um, but, Mr. Speaker, after that admonition, I have a lot to think about. And I may just re examine. Um, the allocations and the amounts that have been pledged to certain parts of this country. <laughs> Mr. Deputy Speaker, I rise in support of the Appropriation Bill 2024-2025, commonly referred to many in our country as the budget, the budget statement, or even the budget address. But as I delve, Mr. Speaker, or before rather I delve into the substantive part of my presentation, I crave your indulgence and that of colleagues to extend condolences to Geneva and their family of Ulio Patrice, who lost a loved one, Gina Princess Joseph, Mr. Speaker. She passed away in the US at the tender age of 13. She was dearly loved by her family, and naturally, Mr. Speaker, the pain would be excruciating for that particular family. I must also express condolences to all the families, all other families that have lost loved ones in the recent past in the Denry North constituency. Um, Kathy Tina, a lady from Olio, who was a co-worker of mine at the, the Olio Combined School, Mr. Speaker. And whilst I was stationed in the grade six classroom, commonly referred to as standard four back then, she worked at that school as a, uh, uh, an ancillary worker and tomorrow she buries her son Boone, and I want to express, Mr. Speaker, condolences or extend condolences to her and her family. I also want to extend condolences to the family and friends of Bertram Stew St. Catherine, the caretaker at the Binfield Secondary School, Mr. Speaker, Deputy Speaker, who's a constituent of yours, who served education for almost three decades at three different institutions in the South, namely what we knew as Campus A back then, the Viewfort Technical School, and more recently, the Binfield Secondary School. Mr. Speaker, he was loved by the students, staff, faculty, and everybody he interfaced with at the Binfield Secondary School. Mr. Speaker, I must also extend condolences to the family of veteran educator, Benilda Alfons, a teacher, who was at the time of her passing attached to the Library Girls School. Um, but prior to being deployed to the Library Girls School, Mr. Speaker, she had stints at the Bocage Secondary and the Dame Poulet Primary School. Mr. Speaker, like the member for Chozelle Saltibus, I must express or extend condolences to the family of Mr. Lambert Smith of Saltibus. Mr. Speaker, it's no secret that he was a staunch supporter of the United Workers' Party. However, his admiration for my disposition in the politics was something he spoke about openly whenever an opportunity presented in itself. We were extremely cordial with each other, Mr. Speaker. And in the words of my colleague from Labry is not here, as he journeys to the silent continent, um, I hope that he can find eternal rest. Mr. Speaker, I will extend get well wishes to a constituent in the person of James Alexander, better known as Apu, who is currently warded at the OKEU, where he's been for a couple of days and I want to wish him a speedy recovery, Mr. Speaker. And lastly, before I get to the substantive part of my presentation on the budget, I want to extend belated birthday wishes to Carlin of Richford, a former student of mine whom I prefer to call by her father's name, Falco. She celebrated her 30th yesterday. And Mr. Speaker, also, also Butch Francis, of Denny Rivier, who last Saturday celebrated 40. Butch is a fast bowler who enjoyed very decent returns in the domestic Marbella Valley Cricket League. But the good thing about it for him is that we were on the same team and he never had to face the wrath of the MP for Denry North when he was at the summit of, of his game. But Mr. Speaker, my best form in cricket is behind me, maybe two decades behind me. What I can tell you when it comes to the politics of Denry North, 
and the business of the Labour Party, I believe I am in the form of my life. And having listened to the PM as he presented the budget statement on Tuesday evening, Mr. Speaker, I have a lot to look forward to with the people of Denrinov and, of course, the agencies, ministries and departments that are in my ministerial purview. Mr. Speaker, tomorrow, Lynette Alfred reaches a milestone at the Denny Rivier Combined School, where she celebrates her 42nd year as a teacher at that institution. And Mr. Speaker, I want to, on behalf of all the constituents of Denry North, congratulate uh, Mrs. Alfred for having served the community, served the district, and by extension, our country um, so diligently. Mr. Speaker, it was the legendary Barbadian cricket commentator, Andrew Mason, who, whilst doing commentary on a regional Red Stripe cricket game many years ago, remarked that form is temporary, but class is permanent. And there's nothing more pleasing and divine than when a class player finds himself at the summit or commanding heights of his craft. And Mr. Speaker, if I were to liken the Prime Minister's presentation on Tuesday night to a cricket match, everyone who was in the house or whoever else's voice could have been heard, Mr. Speaker, would unequivocally conclude that he was seeing that Prime Ministerial ball as big as the proverbial breadfruit. Breadfruit, Mr. Speaker, much bigger than the ones cultivated in the backyard of the member for Viewford North. <laughs> Tuesday evening, Mr. Speaker, provided another stark reminder of the quality of the member for Castries East and Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, on Tuesday evening, we were treated to yet another masterclass by a man whose experience, competence, compassion, his commitment to the well-being of this country, Mr. Speaker, cannot be questioned. And as I indicated on Tuesday night, Mr. Speaker, that was in the full view of everybody who had time and an appreciation for the forward march of our country. On Tuesday evening, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister unveiled a suite of policies, projects, and programs that will positively impact the Ministry of Education and its satellite agencies, the Department of Sustainable Development and its line agencies, and the people of Denry North, and ultimately, Mr. Speaker, the people of St. Lucia. And notwithstanding all that the Prime Minister and his government have been able to achieve during this term of government, Mr. Speaker, where we have just gone beyond the halfway mark, there are surrogates and associates of the opposition, Mr. Speaker, who at every opportunity are trying to denounce and discredit the work of our government. Mr. Speaker, noise is the easiest thing to make in politics. And the loudness of the individuals is usually a reflection of their emptiness. The amplified voices, Mr. Speaker, of the opposition and its surrogates, a group, a clique, a side, no cohesion, no formation, no semblance of togetherness, Mr. Speaker. All they are concerned about is to try and regain power at any cost, not realizing, Mr. Speaker, that their posture is not in keeping with the well-being of our country. Mr. Speaker, we see an alliance of failed and recycled politicians masquerading this country, making it seem as if this government is not working in the interest of the people of this St. Lucia. Mr. Speaker, the attacks are vile and they are nasty on a daily basis. Anybody who attempts to oppose the posture of the United Workers' Party, you become a target. And it doesn't matter, Mr. Speaker, whether you're in the clergy, whether you're a private individual, whether you have served your country with dignity and pride over time, that is not their business. They come, Mr. Speaker, for cutthroat and to derail anything that is associated, or anybody associated with the St. Lucia Labour Party. The desperation is therefore all to see. The denigration of character is the order of the day. Mr. Speaker, they will not 
they will not succeed in their attempts to derail the commitment of this government, nor will they derail the desire of this, the people of this country to retain the St. Lucia Labour Party as the government that always produces for the people of this country. Mr. Speaker, when they try <coughs> sorry, to shamelessly paint us as a government not working in the interest of the people, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we are the government that has made it possible for public officers to be able to go to the bank, notwithstanding their own personal circumstances, to get a mortgage and to put a shelter, Mr. Speaker, over their head. Mr. Speaker, a power-hungry opposition, prepared to do anything, as I indicated, Mr. Speaker, to gain the levels of government. They attack everybody, anybody, anytime, anywhere, via any medium. And Mr. Speaker, you know what? Notwithstanding the grand charge and the posture, I am comforted when I hear even their own supporters in constituency respectfully say, Maliba, my government is not going to be I have said to them in Denry North, Mr. Speaker, that we are prepared to embrace all constituents to move the constituency forward. On the eve of the 2021 general elections, a gentleman by the name of Joseph Similien, better known as Blanchiot, he's in his 80s. He has been a diehard supporter of the Labour Party all his life. He was so convinced, Mr. Speaker, that we would have won the last election that he started saying to some members of the UWP, Pavini Trinahaple. And I had to admonish him on several occasions to let him know that trains are pas jamais plein. And that there will always be room in a Labour Party setup for St. Lucians who want to work in the interest of the constituency and in the interest of our country. So, Mr. Speaker, when they talk about the CIP program and make it seem as if there is something untoward about the CIP program in St. Lucia, when just a few days ago our CIP program was ranked as being in the top five in the world, Mr. Speaker. But, Mr. Speaker, they believe it is politically expedient to create doubt in the minds of St. Lucians. And they're not satisfied with the mischief that they, they cultivate on local soil. They travel overseas to try and discredit the good name of St. Lucia, all in an attempt, Mr. Speaker, to be in government again. A group of individuals who came into government with a heavy ma mandate. But by the first year, St. Lucians had become so disgruntled, had so much disaffection for them, Mr. Speaker, that we staged the biggest protest match held in the history of this country. Mr. Speaker, they have criticized us for not signing the MOA or the Memorandum of Agreement as it relates to the CIP. Mr. Speaker, the record of the St. Lucia Labour Party on the regional integration front is as impressive as that of any other country in the Caribbean. So when the Prime Minister or as a government we decided that we were not signing, Mr. Speaker, our position was not intended to hurt anybody. And in as much as you are committed to the regional integration movement, as much as you are committed to the Caribbean cause, Mr. Speaker, every single island Every single sovereign country in the Caribbean has had reason to step back, engage in a bit of introspection, and say, I am not going the original way on this particular matter because I believe it is in the best interest of our country. And that should never be interpreted to mean that we are not committed to the regional cause. There are circumstances, Mr. Speaker, that affect every country on the domestic front that will take precedent over a regional imperative. So, Mr. Speaker, we have to remind them that it is the St. Lucia Labour Party government that has always projected the best images of stability, performance, growth, and prosperity for St. Lucia at any given time in the history of our country. So when they attack CIP, Mr. Speaker, they have to will and come again. Mr. Speaker, they want to attack us on crime. And you can't help but observe with despair when it comes across as if the opposition, not necessarily the parliamentary op opposition, but the wider grouping of the opposition. It's as if they are celebrating criminality when it happens in this country. And Mr. Speaker, historically, 
they have always attempted to politicize crime. When we were in opposition and the crime situation was spiraling out of control, I challenged the opposition to produce any document or any footage from social media or mainstream media where the St. Lucia Labour Party had a posture where we were celebrating crime. When we were called to the table to discuss crime as an opposition, the then opposition leader, Mr. Speaker, made himself available. And on days when he wasn't available, he ensured that the St. Lucia Labour Party was adequately represented when the conversation was happening in relation to crime. But what happens today? I am not going to come here and exhibit ostrich syndrome, bury my head in the sun and make it seem in the sand and make it seem as if we don't have a crime problem. Of course, the homicide rates in this country are too high. We will be the first to make that admission. But Mr. Speaker, we will insist that solving crime in this country is not a function of the government alone. Civil society organizations have a role to play. The, the opposition as an organization, Mr. Speaker, has a role to play. Parents have a contribution to make, Mr. Speaker. But there's only so much you can do as a government. The police complained about not having adequate resources. Mr. Speaker, in the recent past, no administration has done more for the police than this current administration of the St. Lucia Labour Party. Mr. Speaker, we amended legislation to give special powers to the police. We have given the police in excess of 54 vehicles of all types, Mr. Speaker. We have provided training. We have provided equipment, cameras, scanners, Mr. Speaker. We have attempted to improve the infrastructure. The view fort or the Southern Divisional Headquarters is currently being refurbished to the tune of millions of dollars, Mr. Speaker. The Northern Divisional Headquarters in Grosile is currently under construction. And very recently, the Prime Minister gave a commitment to the police and by extension, the people of this country, that a new police administration building or headquarters, if you prefer, will be constructed soon from now to ensure that the police have an administrative environment within which for them to operate. But Mr. Speaker, when you hear people talk about the government not being serious about crime, what do they want us to do? You have to draw a very solid line between the policymaker and the police officers who are the technical people involved in this. Do they want us as politicians to go up to Chesterfield and instruct what should happen on a daily basis? That is not our role, Mr. Speaker. And to whom much is given, much is expected. So when we invest millions of dollars into the police service as a response to the crime situation that we have, Mr. Speaker, as a government, there are certain questions we have to ask the police. I came into this parliament after election. I held a Bible in my hand. And I took an oath, Mr. Speaker, that I will be fair in the discharge of my duties. And if I believe at the level of the administration or in certain areas the police are found wanting, Mr. Speaker, on behalf of the people of Denry North, who do not have a voice to come in this parliament to give expression to their concerns, I will do so on their behalf. So when we give 50, almost 60 vehicles, we are spending tens of millions of dollars on infrastructure. We have to demand more. But I will be very, very quick to say, Mr. Speaker, that crime is not a function of the police. It mirrors the decay in society. And it starts with the young. It starts in the school system. It starts at home, Mr. Speaker. And I've made the point here before that when you see certain acts of indiscipline manifesting themselves in the school system, Mr. Speaker, it usually mirrors what obtains in the wider society. So if we have a problem with guns in the community, invariably the guns will infiltrate the school system. And then everybody, Mr. Speaker, out of convenience, begins to chide the education system, the Ministry of Education, the teachers, and the principals. The one thing I have always said is that we will not give up on the children of this country interested in our care. We will do whatever we can with the resources at our disposal. But it is the responsibility of parents. It is the responsibility of families to teach our children right from wrong at an early age. When your child has violated a school rule and the teacher admonishes that child, Mr. Speaker, I do not want to see parents marching down to the school 
ready to engage in fist fights with teachers because the teachers attempted to put that child on, on the right path. And that is not me saying that some teachers have not transgressed in the past in terms of the measures they've resorted to. But Mr. Speaker, we have to be very careful what message and what signal we send to our, our young people. Mr. Speaker, the opposition pedal lies about ours not being a caring government. Mr. Speaker, who stopped the laptop program? Who denied the children of St. Lucia a device that gave them connectivity to the world? Mr. Speaker, who denied the children of St. Lucia an opportunity where they could have been on the same plane as their counterparts from more developed countries? Mr. Speaker, we are not only a government about the poor and the marginalized, but when you look at the range of programs, the range of policies that we present to this country, in as much as, Mr. Speaker, we are the government that started the distress fund and they stopped it, notwithstanding all explanations they've given, it is the St. Lucia Labour Party who has reinstated the distress fund. A distress fund is an amount in the office of the Prime Minister so that when something happens to you, and, 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 and the most glaring example is when your house, your little plywood house that you struggled, a lot of people in this country are not able to go to the bank and take a mortgage to build a two-story concrete structure, but Mr. Speaker, they can put 10 sheets of plywood together, paint it up, and have a nice flower garden, and in those little plywood structures, Mr. Speaker, you find love, you find tranquility, you find peace, and sometimes they are at work at the hotel or in the garden, and then it goes up in flames, no insurance, and they have to start back from scratch. And the Kerins and Lucia Labour Party government, during the period 2011 to 2016, gave birth to the distress fund. They came in, they took it out. They took it out. The same government that can take out the distress fund from the programming of government is the same one that would enable or create an environment in which $112 million could have been spent on horses. But they tell you we're not a caring government. This is because not only poor people, you know. This government created a tax amnesty and we waive millions of dollars to businesses. So we're helping those persons who are less fortunate on their level, at that level of the scale, but we are also reaching out to the business community to give them a break because we understand the contribution of private sector involvement to the, the, the development of our country and, 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 and our people. Mr. Speaker, pensioners who have been out of work for a very, very long time, and whereas the cost of living and inflation and everything continues to rise, Mr. Speaker, on the little that they got monthly, they had to make ends meet. They had to take care of themselves. They had to pay their bills. This is because they had to look after their medical expenses on the little that they got. And this Prime Minister has come in this budget and is saying, and it wasn't a case where pensioners had an association that held him at ransom, you know, Mr. Speaker. That is a man who is the epitome of compassion. And being cognizant of the, the plight of pensioners, he has come into the budget and said to pensioners, in much the same way that unionized workers are agitating for increases and everybody wants more, we have not forgotten you and we give you. And Mr. Speaker, I can tell you the few pensioners I've spoken to are extremely elated at this intervention. And this is what we mean when we took to the hustings. This is what we meant. And this is what we mean in government today when we tell you we are putting people first. Mr. Speaker, they speak a lot of untruths about our Prime Minister and the performance of our government. Mr. Speaker, which administration has consistently registered the lowest unemployment figures in this country? Mr. Speaker, the most glaring and obvious expressions of investor confidence in this country for a very long time is happening now. And when you had a number of hotels and mega projects that are in the pipeline. And sometimes I chide the Minister for Investment and the Prime Minister to a lesser extent. Why are we not coming out to make those pronouncements? But the Prime Minister is very guarded. He wants for the sword to be turned and he wants to see action even before he can make certain pronouncements. But then, just the drawings they had, 
They were parading everywhere in this country talking about billions of dollars of investment. Mr. Speaker, this is the government for St. Lucia. This is the government that puts people first. This is the government that looks after the marginalized. This is the government that looks after the poor in this country. And this is the government, Mr. Speaker, that will ensure that irrespective of your station in life, St. Lucia is a place where everybody can coexist and can meet their individual goals while at the same time moving our country forward. Mr. Speaker, I'm going to that government Et puis le Premier ministre a venu ici à Madi au souhait. Pour ça, nous avons créé un budget de débite. Le Premier ministre a venu et puis plan pour l'année qui nous a dit présentement. Avec différents bagages, il a été fait par tout le secteur et puis tout le monde en pays. Et je vais dire que pour un chèque, Mr. Speaker, nous pouvons jouer une pièce de qualité, un statement, un budget, en ce qui est déjà passé, que le Premier ministre a venu ici et qu'il y a un en bagage par tout le monde. Le Parlement pour choisir, il veut dire que c'est un bon budget. Mais il essaie de dire que c'est la dernière bail pour tout le monde. Et Mr. Speaker, moi, ça, pour qui raison, il ne veut pas dire que le budget est un bon budget. Parce que si il dit ça, il y a un chèque bagage pour répondre à côté de l'aile et puis l'autre monde qui n'est même pas chill. Moi, même quand il n'est même pas chill, quand il est venu à ce moment-là, le gouvernement nous a fait. Mr. Speaker, allow me to turn my attention to the tremendous work that is being done or being undertaken by the Department of Sustainable Development, one of the bigger agencies in my ministerial remit. Permit me to share a bit of the accomplishments in combating what we call the triple planetary crisis of climate change, biodiversity, loss, and pollution. Mr. Speaker, Green Climate Fund National Adaptation Plan Readiness Project. Over the next two to three years, St. Lucia will receive approximately $4.5 million to implement a Jeff Readiness and Preparatory Support Program, a project which will allow St. Lucia to develop adaptation strategies and action plans for the remaining priority sectors of education, tourism, infrastructure, and of course, spatial planning. Mr. Speaker, you may recall that adaptation strategies and action plans have already been developed for, a priority, for the priority sectors of agriculture, fisheries, water, and resilient ecosystems. These sectors will prioritize through a highly inclusive and participatory process. By utilizing such an approach, Mr. Speaker, the capacity of critical institutions and line ministries in national adaptation planning is being enhanced. So, Mr. Speaker, the National Adaptation Plan is a very critical policy document. And whereas the function resides in the Department of Sustainable Development, we are fully cognizant that for us to have a National Adaptation Plan that truly reflects the ideals of our country, some of the more critical sectors have to be adequately represented and have their input in this document so as to position St. Lucia as our other counterparts in the world to make good on some of the environmental issues that we face. Mr. Speaker, these sectors were prioritized, as I indicated, through a participatory process. So it wasn't a case where the technocrats from the Department of Sustainable Development met in a room and they decided what to include in the document. There were instances when they went into communities to get to have engagements with locals to inform the final policy document. Mr. Speaker, critical to the success of this initiative is the full involvement of the private sector as well. And so with this in mind, <coughs> particular stakeholders in the banking, financial, and insurance sectors will be actively engaged through targeted interventions using the private sector engagement strategy as a guiding document. The private sector engagement strategy outlines eight critical ways in which domestic and international private sectors can be effectively engaged in climate adaptation actions. Mr. Speaker, in order to strengthen the national understanding of coastal vulnerability and risk to which we are exposed, the Readiness Grant will undertake detailed modeling of St. Lucia's coastal zone and its exposure to sea level rise and flooding risk. Mr. Speaker, we've all heard about climate change and the debilitating effect it can have on small island states like St. Lucia. As the global temperature or the temperature of the earth increases, Mr. Speaker, the polar caps, they melt. And as they melt, it contributes to sea level rise. 
and so for almost every island in the Caribbean. There is evidence where the shoreline has been pushed inland and the sea is claiming what we knew as beach, what we knew as, as, as the, 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 the shoreline, or even the Queen's Chain. And we have to find ways to live with that particular phenomenon. Mr. Speaker, the two defining terms in the whole climate change discourse are adaptation and mitigation. Adaptation refers to what you have to do to coexist with the impacts or the effects of climate change. Whereas mitigation, on the other hand, Mr. Speaker, speaks to the things that we have to do to reduce greenhouse gas emission and to ensure we do not further um, exacerbate some of the, the, the problems that we are currently um, experiencing. Mr. Speaker, we have to increase the resilience of our population, particularly our vulnerable coastal communities and enterprises, our infrastructure, our economic sectors like fisheries and tourism. Mr. Speaker, overall, the strategy set of actions undertaken for this project will result in several positive outcomes, including a more informed and knowledgeable citizenry. And that is very important. We can have all the conversations we want about climate change. We can attend all the international meetings, COP and whatever else. If, Mr. Speaker, we do not have a knowledgeable citizen, a population that appreciates the impact of climate change and environmental degradation, whether it is biodiversity loss, Mr. Speaker, or it is pol or, or pollution, Mr. Speaker, it makes the work of technical officers and the government a lot more difficult. And so, during this term of government, Mr. Speaker, we have been able to successfully enact legislation in relation to climate change. The climate change bill came to this house, and Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to report that I was the minister who presented the climate change bill, which is today the Climate Change Act. And that bill, or that piece of legislation, is very necessary because it aligns St. Lucia with the rest of the world in terms of the resources you can access and how active a participant you can be in the whole global climate change discourse. Mr. Speaker, smallness of size can work against you in the international community, particularly in the realm of climate change. And against that backdrop, we have always attempted to deal with some of our climate change issues or environmental issues as an OECS, as CARICOM, and we have gone further, Mr. Speaker, through AOSIS, which is the Association of Small Island States, to, to, to Mr. Speaker, um, um, give expression to what we in the Caribbean suffer um, in much the same way that our counterparts from the Pacific um, um, suffer. The bill signals St. Lucia's commitment to combating climate change to the rest of the world by establishing an approved national coordinated response to climate change mitigation, adaptation, and loss and damage. And let me say, Mr. Speaker, as it relates to loss and damage, that for two COPs that I've attended, or the, the, the more recent ones in Glasgow, um, um, Sharm El Sheikh, um, and, and thirdly, Mr. Speaker, um, Dubai, the whole concept of loss and damage was on the cards. And loss and damage basically speaks to small island developing states that do not necessarily have the resources to deal with the impact of climate change. Mr. Speaker, we have more ferocious hurricanes. We have weather patterns that have become very erratic and unpredictable. We are now exposed to, to, to more severe rainfall, Mr. Speaker, on the one hand, and in the dry season, the droughts are a lot worse than what we would have experienced in times past. It has implications for farmers, it has implications for schools, and it even can impact the health of our people. And we're saying that all of those are caused by climate change. And as a result, we have to find the monies. Notwithstanding, we have small economies who can hardly pay our bills on our own, but we are being asked to pay for something we did not create. And we're saying there is need for climate justice. We are saying that there is need at the international community for the establishment of a loss and damage fund. And whereas a commitment was given in Sharm El Sheikh, Egypt, at, at, at COP, Mr. Speaker, I was happy when I left Dubai at COP in December to have learned that significant progress had been made on the establishment of the loss and damage fund. 
but it is not unheard of in the, in the international community, where things are established and then it is extremely bureaucratic for small island states to be able to access the resources to make things happen. I see the member for Grosdele, Mr. Speaker, nodding, because not too long ago, when they were roasting nuts in Viewfort because of the amount of sunshine they had on that particular day, appliances, Mr. Speaker, were floating in the streets of Corinth and other parts of the constituency because of a deluge where a weather system remained stationary over his constituency and in the space of two hours, Mr. Speaker, the damage was untold and it was quantified in the tens of millions. And that is the reality of climate change. And that is how we have to distill the concept of climate change to the average man. That in the month of May, or April going into May, Mr. Speaker, there are no signs of rain. And we know what it does to the hospital. Only recently, the minister had to install a, 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 a massive tank to ensure that there's adequate water at the hospital so that the medical professionals can continue discharging their duties to the patients. Mr. Speaker, we have suffered loss of instruction time at our schools because the supply has been inadequate at times in some pockets because of the excessive dry season. Mr. Speaker, I want to speak about the electric vehicle mobility. The share of the transport sector to greenhouse gas emission in St. Lucia is substantial, almost 98%. And like the rest of the world, we are moving to phase out, Mr. Speaker, vehicles that rely on petrol to traverse our roads. It will take us some time. We do not have the resources that the more developed countries have, but we have demonstrated that there's a commitment to get it done, Mr. Speaker. And we are proposing to start by having some of the, the, the electrical vehicles, electric vehicles, Mr. Speaker, in the government fleet. I will be saying more on this, Mr. Speaker, in the coming days, notwithstanding that I have only utilized 10 minutes of my time, uh, Mr. Speaker, but there's a lot more that I will be saying on this. Mr. Speaker, I also have the, the, the education portfolio on which to speak and also shed light on some of the dynamics for Denry North in relation to, to the budget as presented by the Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, biodiversity is another area of programming for the Department of Sustainable Development. With respect to biodiversity, St. Lucia can boast of a high degree of biodiversity with over 200 endemic species with our waters supporting a number of globally and regionally important habitats and species. In order to safeguard these precious resources, while also ensuring we meet our obligations under the Convention on Biological Diversity, Mr. Speaker, work is being undertaken at the policy and at the community level with the recent commencement of two projects funded by the Global Environment Facility. These are the Global Biodiversity Framework Early Action Support Grant and the Strengthening Access and Benefit Sharing Policies and Institutional Frameworks through Demonstrable Models in St. Lucia Projects or the ABS Projects in short. While Early Action Support Grant Mr. Speaker valued at approximately $714,000 will be used to review St. Lucia's National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan and determine coherence between national targets and actions with the global biodiversity framework. Mr. Speaker, where gaps exist, the national targets will be updated to ensure alignment with the global biodiversity framework. The second project, Mr. Speaker, the ABS is valued at approximately $4.3 million and will, over the next three years, support the opera, opera, operationalization of the Niagara Protocol on access to genetic resources and the fair and equitable sharing of benefits arising from their utilization. Mr. Speaker, there's a practice from so-called technocrats, scientists, professors who come into our country. They tap into the natural resources that we have. They exploit it more than they explore it and they are able to derive millions out of it, Mr. Speaker, when they return. Mr. Speaker, by this I mean the project will establish a mechanism to facilitate the effective use of our valuable biodiversity and the traditional knowledge associated with it. For this mechanism, which will develop a legal and institutional framework covering access and benefits sharing in St. Lucia, a permitting system for accessing St. Lucia's genetic resources and mutually agreed terms for the use of our genetic resources, 
St. Lucia will have greater control over the use of our own genetic resources. Mr. Speaker, mindful of the need to ensure that the rights of local communities who possess the traditional knowledge and are custodians of these genetic resources are recognized and respected, the project will take deliberate steps to actively engage and build their capacities. Mr. Speaker, one example is our the Federalist Snake in St. Lucia. I'm extremely pleased and I applaud the project for the inclusion of a component that will demonstrate through pilot how our genetic resources can be explored for commercial development and the airmarking of two species for this particular undertaking. The St. Lucia Viper, also known as the Federalist, which is no stranger to the member for Denry South, having served as the country's lead officer in the forestry department for several years. Mr. Speaker, it has been brought to our attention that the venom of the Federalist has huge economic potential, and we are going to regulate how people come here and they use that uh, or look to exploit it. Mr. Speaker, a lot of work is being done in the area of chemicals and hazardous waste management, but the time will not permit me to delve into, to delve into how we can contribute to safeguarding um, the depletion of, of or reduce greenhouse gas emissions and other gases or substances that deplete the ozone layer. And a particular officer in the department, Mrs. Keisha Zabatis, Mr. Speaker, um, has been doing quite a bit of work and would have loved for me to see a lot more on this than time will permit me. Mr. Speaker, permit me to move to the area of education. The Prime Minister spoke extensively on education on Tuesday night. Mr. Speaker, he quoted our very own Sir Arthur Lewis, who posited that education, or the fundamental cure for poverty, is not money, but knowledge. Mr. Speaker, Nelson Mandela went further when he said that education is the most powerful weapon you can use to change the world. And Mr. Speaker, the importance of education to this government has been underscored by the quantum that the Prime Minister has made available for or made available to the Ministry of Education for this particular budget period. Mr. Speaker, I will move straight into early childhood education, one of our areas of program. Early childhood education is a very, compon very important component of the Ministry of Education's work. Mr. Speaker, early childhood education facilitates brain development. It encourages children at a very tender age to socialize in an environment that is caring. And in a number of cases, we have children in our system who do not have that enabling environment at home. And the early childhood centers to which they report on a daily basis have proven to be precisely what they need, Mr. Speaker, to grow up and to be nurtured as children who will eventually become productive citizens. At the early childhood centers, Mr. Speaker, they get a proper meal and nutrition. And very importantly, Mr. Speaker, these children report to environments that would stimulate their development, um, both cognitively and also their psychomotor skills. We recently, at the Ministry of Education, appointed a new head through the Service Commission to the Early Childhood um, Development Unit in the person of Ms. Zephrina Lansico, Mr. Speaker, whose previous um, post in the Ministry of Education was that of principal at the Canaries Infant School. It's just a couple of weeks now, maybe two or three weeks, since she reported to the Early Childhood Unit as the lead person in there, having received training at the postgraduate level in Early Childhood Education. I am sure, Mr. Speaker, notwithstanding she is new to the unit, that she will be able to draw from the, 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 the wealth of experience and, and, and expertise that exists in the unit, um, given that the, the individual, Ms. Bruce, who held the fort prior to that appointment being made, Mr. Speaker, is an authority um, on early childhood education. In St. Lucia to date, Mr. Speaker, we have a total enrollment of 3,460 students or children in early childhood centers. But interestingly, Mr. Speaker, out of the 3,460 children we have in early childhood centers, only 806 attend 
public or government run daycare or early childhood centers. And you have a whopping 2,654 children attending daycares, preschools, or early childhood centers run by private individuals in our community. In our community. So, Mr. Speaker, it is fair to say that the private individuals carry or they bear the brunt of the early childhood load in this country. And government only operates 21 centers and private owners or operators account for 93. And as I said, Mr. Speaker, given us a total of 114 early childhood centers and the private sector carrying the brunt in his wisdom, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister not being asked to do so by the technocrats of the Ministry of Education or being chided by the Minister of Education. But after the figures were presented to him on his own volition, in the first instance, the Prime Minister saw it necessary to make a one-time contribution, Mr. Speaker, of $2,500 to each of the 93 private registered early childhood centers in this country. Mr. Speaker, I'm extremely extremely pleased with that particular intervention. But not having, or notwithstanding the fact that the majority of them are privately run, we will continue to ensure that there are tight controls and that the standards are maintained. In areas where, where, where early childhood service providers have to be spoken to, we will. But we will never resort to a punitive approach, Mr. Speaker, where the intention is to derail or drop the guillotine on everybody. We will work with them, we will make the assessments, and in areas where they need the support, we will take them by the hand, given the critical nature of the service that they, they, they so diligently provide to our country. Mr. Speaker, we will monitor them, as I said, um, and we're hoping that in the coming weeks we will see drastic improvements in the area of early childhood. There's a lot more I want to say, but in the interest of time, Mr. Speaker, I have to move on to, to, to another area. And Only to say, 15 minutes left. thank you, Mr. Speaker, that in the estimates of expenditure and revenue for this year, we had an allocation of $148,398 for the registration of new early childhood centers. And Mr. Speaker, the Pasteur's Early Childhood Center, which was mentioned by the member for, for Mikudnov, comes to mind, Mr. Speaker, and not too far behind is the Early Childhood Center in Grindvier Denry, which is privately run. And come September or the ensuing academic year, Mr. Speaker, um, this will be a government-run run, um, early childhood center. We have opened quite a few pre-K classes, but time will not permit me because there are other areas of the education portfolio I want to speak on, Mr. Speaker, in addition to giving expression, as I indicated, to some of the issues that confront the people of Denrinov. Mr. Speaker, scholarships and higher education. In the front page, His Excellency said, and I quote, in reference to Julian Alfred, this young lady of humble background has given us reason to be proud St. Lucians. Her tenacity and self-belief must be an inspiration to all of us. And he went on further to see, her achievement is a reminder that talent and ability are not the preserve of those enabled by privilege and resources. Mr. Speaker, I want to repeat this. Her achievement is a reminder that talent and ability are not the preserve of those enabled by privilege and resources. In other words, what he was saying, Mr. Speaker, and I'll attempt to translate in Creole. That moon pa bon or sa fe go bagay ki sou ni an chay l'ajan e bou sorti an fami ki wish. Me depi ou ni abilite, depi ou ni sante, ek ni moun ki ka pousso ou, ou sa achieve preske ni pot bagay ou vle achieve. And I want to preface my contribution to higher education and scholarship on, on, on that particular quote. Mr. Speaker, our government has been pushing the one university graduate per household agenda from day one since we came into government. But it's more than just the university graduate. And today I want to speak of a term that is even more inclusive and speak about higher education. Mr. Speaker, from 2021, when we came into government, to present, to today, Mr. Speaker, the government of St. Lucia, the administration led by the member for Castries East, has awarded a total of 700 
and 52 higher educational opportunities to young St. Lucians, Mr. Speaker. A total of 440 university scholarships. And Mr. Speaker, a total of 312 bursaries to students attending the South Louis Louis Community College, Mon Campus, South Louis Louis Community College, Southern Extension, the Viewport Comprehensive Cape Program, the Ministry of Education Post-Secondary Program, giving us a total, as I indicated, of 440 university scholarships, 312 bursary programs, a total of 752. And Mr. Speaker, if you had to add the interventions that are being made by members through the constituency development allocation, I am certain that we have assisted over 800 young St. Lucians from the day we entered office to today. So Mr. Speaker, we are on course with our higher education program. I know Tessa Swanson of Denny Riviere who never went to high school, but through the programming of this government, she never went to secondary school. But because of our scholarship program today, as I speak, Mr. Speaker, if I should invoke a quote from the member for Vivo South, whom I think was quoting a former Castries Central representative in the person of George Marlett. As we speak, or as I speak, is that what he said? Donisa David, as we speak, Donisa David, who is the daughter of Tessa Swanson, is in Cuba studying to become a medical doctor. Mr. Speaker, I know Isaac and Lera from Tigadet. Their story is the same. They never went to high school or secondary school. Not because they were not bright or they were dumb, but at the time that they went to school, the higher educational opportunities or secondary places were limited, and just a few could have gone to secondary school. So they never went to secondary school. But Mr. Speaker, today, Elora Rumpal, Elora Rumpal, their daughter, is set, has been chosen, to take her, right, her rightful place at a medical university in Cuba. So that by the time she returns, Mr. Speaker, the Larissus Health Center will be ready for her. By the time she returns, the St. Jude Hospital will be ready for her. By the time she returns, Mr. Speaker, would have effected changes at the OKEU to cause her to take her rightful place as a doctor and as a medical practitioner in this country. And these are the children of ordinary people. And that is why I had to invoke His Excellency when he said, Mr. Speaker, that achievement, to paraphrase, is not our ability. Those are not the preserve of people whose circumstances are better in life. Kim Budu of Denny Rivier has presented his acceptance letter because he's excited about the first generation program. Janaitya Jalim of Denny Rivier, Mr. Speaker, wants to be a doctor, and she has been accepted and she has been chosen. Her mother never went to any high school to talk about. But you know what, Mr. Speaker, the satisfaction I derive from that program is when they can, this, the parents can tell you the circumstances. They admit that they never made it in, 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 in the education realm. And in quite a few instances, not because of their doing, but the opportunities were not available. But today, a St. Lucia Labour Party government can roll out scholarship programs and can reach out to the children of those individuals and say, come here, go and take your place and sit in the walls of, the, of those universities, whether it's in Morocco, Cuba, or wherever else in the world, and come back and serve your country. I'm a proud minister of education. When I see them at the airport, in the departure lounge, Mr. Speaker, they pack their bags and they go in to better themselves to come back to serve our country. That is what we mean when we say we are putting people first. Mr. Speaker, school supervision and support. You have five minutes left, member. School supervision and support, Mr. Speaker. The Vivot Comprehensive Secondary School, Mr. Speaker, is one of the better performing schools in this country. There is an allocation, Mr. Speaker, in the budget. There is a, Mr. Speaker, I want to be heard in silence, please. There is an allocation in the budget for the statement or the inst for, to install, sorry, Mr. Speaker, a vice principal at the Vivot Comprehensive Secondary School. At present, the school has an enrollment of 974 students. And we anticipate come September, Mr. Speaker, that the enrollment will move from 974 to approximately 1,040 students. And so the current administrative structure had to be reviewed, Mr. Speaker. And it is against that backdrop we have advertised the position to have a second vice principal that will help streamline the management of the school 
to free up the principal to be able to make more informed decisions on a daily basis to help the school continue its forward march. The member would have indicated, member for Viewfort South, Mr. Speaker, about the achievement of the Viewfort Comprehensive Secondary School, not just on the domestic front, but regionally. And just to give you a snippet in terms of how students from that school performed in regional CAP exams, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in the visual art, Jester Young placed first, not in St. Lucia or in the OCS, but in the entire Caribbean, Mr. Speaker. Vienna Flavius Information Technology, Mr. Speaker, was able to perform better than all her counterparts in Barbados, Jamaica, Trinidad, Guyana, Grenada, and be first place in the entire Caribbean from the Viewport Comprehensive. Accounting, Mr. Speaker, Jester Young, Adela Henry, Environmental Science, Simaj Lambert came third in entrepreneurship originally. Literatures in English, Thomasa Ogis, fifth. Mr. Speaker, Green Energy, Helena James, Cedric Augustine, Benedict Edmund, and Maxim Avril all performed outstandingly, Mr. Speaker, regionally. And Chades Blanchard in tourism, Jester Young again, Mr. Speaker, in economics. So the school is doing well and with a, a, a staff complement of 122. Very big school, Mr. Speaker. Staff or teaching staff of 96, ancillary and other support personnel, 26, gives the school a total staff complement of 122. Mr. Speaker, I cannot even delve into mathematics, the mathematics intervention program, except to say that we have monies in the budget, Mr. Speaker, um, to take care of the mathematics Pardon? Yes, you like? Yes, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister is glad for mathematics. He has made the monies available. Mr. Speaker, the accreditation, and he's a formidable, formidable mathematician himself, Mr. Speaker. Um, but he has a calculator that he uses that the people of Denry North have been able to benefit from tremendously. Mr. Speaker, the accreditation council, I cannot go into. Um, everything I wanted to say about the Accreditation Council because of time, but in the budget we have an amount of 344000 for the establishment of a National Accreditation Council, which is headed by Dr. Alison Kajada. They are doing a tremendous amount of work, and their role is, is, is one, Mr. Speaker, where they basically do due diligence and background checks on a number of institutions that want to provide courses and programs. The role of the Accreditation Council should not be mistaken from the role of the HRD unit in the Ministry of Education. HRD is about certification, but, but there's a lot more to accreditation than certification. Mr. Speaker, this school security, discipline and psychosocial support are also key areas for us. We have monies in the budget to, to bring in additional um, guidance counselors in our school system. We also have a significant amount in the budget, Mr. Speaker, and steps are being taken and will continue to be taken to strengthen security. Mr. Speaker, AFRI Exim, we have spent, or we have so far, Mr. Speaker, almost $20 million to undertake repairs on a number of schools. We would have done repairs using monies from the Tropical Storm Bread allocation. We have the AFRI Exim, which is another allocation, and Mr. Speaker, in the coming weeks, we will also have another allocation to take care of what we call in the Ministry of Education the Summer Works Program, where we do minor repairs to schools, electricals, etc. Mr. Speaker, the people of Denry North have a lot to look forward to. The road infrastructure, Austin Hill, as we speak, has been completed, and for that I must thank the Prime Minister and the Senior Minister. But Mr. Speaker, that main stretch of road from the Richmond Highway into La Pelle, what we call the Mambro Stretch, that road is down for major or total rehabilitation. And I will accept nothing less than Baba Green of a thickness comparable to what we find in Venus and certain parts of Ancillary. Mr. Speaker, the Rich Ring Road is also down for repair and there are so many other routes, but I know you will tell me that my time is up and I need to wrap up, and this is precisely what I'm doing when I say, Mr. Speaker, that this St. Lucia Labour Party is the best team to govern St. Lucia today. Yes. The member for Castries is, is the best man to be at the helm of government today, Mr. Speaker. And the Prime Minister has demonstrated on so many occasions that he is all embracing. And sometimes when we sit in cabinet and we say, 
that we are programming and we are making resources available only to our constituencies, sometimes out of frustration, is quick to admonish and say every one of the 17 members in here will get resources and will be treated with That is the measure of the man, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, when you see the huffing and the puffing, in Denry North these days, everybody is a candidate from what I'm hearing. Mr. Speaker, I am not perturbed. And that should never be interpreted to mean that I am arrogant or I am aloof. I know what I can do for Denry North. I know what I've done for Denry North. And everybody, if for one moment you can be objective, you can say that when the St. Lucia Labour Party and Sean Edward are in, Den in government, Denry North is a better place for us. Mr. Speaker, we may say we be too mum is here, même que tout Denry North qui s'est cassé pour tout le monde. Je tell me that I put it, I said that I put it, 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 2024-2025. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.